Hello, I thought I'd go through the ABRSM syllabus grade by grade with you just to give you a little taste of what we're doing on the online academy with video walkthroughs of every single piece on the main syllabus for each grade. Now, grade one was delayed for some reason, there was a publication hold up. Um, so I'm sitting here first with the grade two book. And it's, it's so lovely to see these pieces out. I was on the initial selection panel for choosing the new syllabus for, for the 2021 and 2022, um, and it went through another panel afterwards, so I was not quite sure what was going to be on the final lists, and it's, it's nice to see some of my selections on there. Um, what I thought I'd do in this video would just be to select one piece from each list, so that's an A piece, a B piece, and a C piece, and just give you, a, 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 I don't know, a little walk through, a few ideas maybe, or just some thoughts that came to me um, about these pieces and why I think they're particularly interesting to, to learn um, for a grade two person. We've got an, a piece, a minuet in A by an Elizabeth, let me see if I can pronounce this name properly, Elisabetta de Gambarini, who was born in 1731 and died in uh, 1765 and she was Italian, uh, parents were Italian, she was a singer and took part apparently in some performances of Handel's oratorios, uh, which I think is a fascinating piece of information and it's right at the bottom here in this paragraph that so many people don't bother to read and yet you can have so much interesting information in it. So. Apart from being a singer, she was also a composer and she published six harpsichord sonatas, um, a book of keyboard pieces mixed with Italian and English songs and 12 songs for flute and continuo. Um, and this was at a time when women were not really uh, in the limelight. Terrible thing when we look back on, on the history, but this is what happened. So how nice to find this minuet by a, a woman composer from the Baroque period with very little by way of articulation. The editors have put some things in there, which all of which very good. So I thought maybe I'd play a little bit of it and then we can walk through it a bit. making my own decisions about articulation um, because as I say not every note is accounted for by way of a marking. Um, we've got a piano marking at the beginning, a suggestion from the editor which works very nicely but then what do we have in the second and the, on the second and third beats? I'm reading those as staccatos because we're, we're playing here a minuet where the second and the third beat often lifted. Um, make a little moment there, there's an expressive moment in a poggiatura. And grade two candidates, I think a lot of them are going to ask, why did the composer write that as a little note, that B? Why don't they just write crutches? <laughs> well, it's obviously it's to show that the B is a decorative note against the main note A. So we would play the, the B firmly and we'd play the A softly. And the way we would do that, the way that we could do that, would just to be to use a drop roll slur. One movement that takes in two notes. And then what do I do here? What do I do with those crotchets? Well, I made a decision there to separate them in the spirit of the minuet. And again, do I have to be too legato here? I don't have to be too legato up there either. I might be. I could do this. Just be a bit lighter, which I would probably want to do myself. Then there's a, a, a forte dynamic marking, a sudden change. Now, of course. 
course, this trill is going to bug people. I did it as, as a fast trill, the realisation that the editor has come up with works that way, where the, uh, the last note of the trill coincides with the D sharp in the bass, which is a, a neater way of doing it if you're unable to get rid of the trill before the bass note. But in either event, you'd certainly separate the crotchets there to connect those quavers. So crotchets lightly separated, quavers sometimes joined, sometimes disconnected. What would it feel like if these were disconnected? Certainly could do that if you fancied it. Now here what happens? Uh, and again an ornament uh, which would be on the beat. It comes on the beat, it sounds much better that way and it's much more stylistically good. And then, now I'm looking at bar 12. There's a place where I would mix and match my uh, staccato legatos. I would connect the first uh, few beats, the first two beats in my left hand, and lighten the third beat. Now what do we do with this section from bar 13? We have a forte marking. We've got quavers down there. Now I can see a lot of grade two people coming to this and tightening up their hands because they're trying to stretch all of this and getting locked here. So we, we need to move our hand so that we start off from a closed position and end in a closed position. The opposite of that. Now do we play those legato? we also separate yes and I personally would would maybe on a Monday uh, separate on a Tuesday I might connect this is the thing with music that there's no one absolute answer my, my tendency there would be to play my right hand rather firmer drop into the first note, the appoggiatura, and then start to release, and at some point on that release trajectory, if my second and my fifth fingers are firm enough, the sound will, will come, and I'll be able to control it. So that's my choice of a two piece, or a piece. Um, in the B section here, I've gone for the O oh, Whaley Whaley, traditional English folk song setting, arranged by Howell Davis. I think it's rather lovely. What, what he's done here is preserved the original folk song. See, I'm already starting to sing. This is the thing. Whenever we're playing a melodic line, we need to sing it in order to feel how to shape it, how to phrase it. I'll try and shut up, though. two bars and what does he do at the top well gives us some rather unusual and pungent I think harmonies Isn't that lovely and then in bar eight we get this delicious false relation there's an E flat in the alto, an E natural down in the bass there. There's going to be a lot of people that wonder why would a composer write something that sounds so dissonant? Well, dissonance is the name of the game, isn't it? Music is can't be, all be about consonants. And, and this is particularly lovely the way he does this very minimalistically. 
you know. And if you think about the Benjamin Britten uh, setting, the folk song setting of this for voice and piano, that that was where I would uh, that's where I would suggest you go first. Have a little listen to that in the folk song setting, and you'll see what Britten does. Then you'll be able to understand a little better what Hal Davis does here. So for hands that are not familiar with these chord shapes, there are six of them in all. There's certain ways that we can practice chord to make the shapes fit our hands really nicely. And I'm going to show you from bar seven and eight, the two chords in bar seven and eight. We've got this chord here, happens to be all white notes. And then we've got in the next bar with an E flat under the second finger. So one of the things I like to do, and this helps people a lot with just making the chord shape fit their hand, if you would play the chord and then just very gently release the bottom finger and play twice, check the wrist, make sure there's nothing there going on here, do the same with the next finger, check the wrist, and the same with the pinky. You can play three times if you want. Then you could lift up the five and the two and hold onto the three. And then you could lift the five and the three. And then take the chord away and go back to it and it should fit like a glove. And that works at any level of piano playing, uh, for the advanced level as well. A, a terrific way, it's quite an old school way of practicing chords. But provided you don't lift your fingers up high, it works a real treat. You do have to check in with your wrist to make sure that there's no tension creeping in. So I highly recommend that. That's the B3 O Whaley Whaley. The last piece I'm going to present now is Angelfish, the C2 piece by Anne Crosby Godet, who was born in 1968. And what I particularly like about this piece is it's really imaginative. She uses a, a good range of the keyboard from high to low. And there's some really interesting and imaginative sounds that she creates here from the pedal. So the pedal is down at the beginning. And so at the beginning, I'm creating the, the feeling of an aquarium. Um, an aquarium obviously has water, my pedal, and it's got little things that float, some sort of weeds or some sort of vines that um, float in the, in the water. And I feel that my right hand is describing that something very floaty. So not too legato, not staccato, but just very mobile in the hand. And I'm crossing over in my left hand from three to three. And there's the angelfish making its first appearance. It's a, it's a lovely idea, this, because she has marked here left hand over and then a phrase mark that takes us from this E to that E, indicating that there's a melodic line as opposed to texture, background texture, that we found at the beginning. And there's, there's something important that comes up here, which is just how we sit at the piano and how we move at the piano. What I'm finding... Um, a lot of people don't use the torso to move over. So when I move from this position here, you see how, I've, how I'm behind the register of the piano that I'm playing in, as opposed to sitting here and reaching across and getting in, in all these sort of quasi-modal positions. So how does that work? Well, when I, when I lean over this way, I find myself moving from my... Uh, moving on to my right sit bone a little bit more, so I'm balanced a little bit more on the right sit bone. I notice that I'm um, expanding here in my rib cage on the right side and contracting on the left side. So I'm able to sit up still, um, be upright as I, as I lean over. What happens here? I'm not, now at bar 13. Things are starting to move downwards. And... and then on the G. And 
then right at the end she goes down, she takes us all the way down to the very bottom A here. So we've, there's a huge range of the keyboard there for, for, a, for a grade two piece. I think that's really quite something. Um, and this is certainly going to capture the imagination of a lot of grade two candidates. So that's just three uh, very, very quick skims through um, in the Online Academy publication that will be coming to you very shortly, there will be detailed walkthroughs of all of the pieces with practice suggestions, um, all sorts of other suggestions. So I'll um, see you then.